Our next speaker is uh, Joyce uh, Van de Bill. Um, uh, she completed uh, her um, uh, thesis on the Moroccan uh, government policy uh, towards its uh, nationals living in the Netherlands um, under the supervision of uh, Professor Ura Shadid. Uh, she is, con uh, she is uh, now a uh, PhD uh, uh, candidate uh, in history at uh, Tel Aviv University, writing her dissertation about uh, the uh, contested uh, memory of the 1952 uh, revolution in Egypt. Thank Please. you. Thank you, Dr. Kayao. Uh, it's my pleasure being here today, speaking at this conference, celebrating the publication of Uriah Shafiq books. Uh, Mazal Tov, also for me. Um, Uriah was my advisor during my MA thesis, and the following talk is based on this MA thesis that I finished in 2012 and that dealt with uh, Moroccan government policy towards its nationals living in the Netherlands, where I'm originally from. So by 2015, Moroccans accounted for the second largest immigrant groups in the Netherlands, amounting to more than three, 380,000 people. This is the result of an ongoing migration process to Europe that commenced with the recruitment of guest workers in the mid-1960s. <coughs> Although they initially arrived as guest workers, most migrants did not return to Morocco, but settled in Europe. After France, Spain, Italy, and Belgium, the fifth largest Moroccan expatriate community lives in the Netherlands. The Moroccan government still seeks to maintain strong ties with this community in Europe. And in this presentation, I will define the ongoing Moroccan state's interest in its expatriate community during the reign of King Mohammed VI and I will discuss the problems this policy can cause in the host state uh, or the challenges that it faces. And I've examined the Moroccan community in the Netherlands as a case study. So I'll start by giving a very brief uh, background of the Dutch Moroccan community. After World War II, the Dutch community was in need of unschooled employees to fill positions mainly in the textile and mining industries. And just like other European countries, um, Holland opted for foreign recruitment to meet these needs. It started receiving guest workers from Southern Europe, but also from North Africa and Turkey. At the same time, the Moroccan state became increasingly interested in stimulating overseas emigrations of its own citizens. This benefited Morocco since it would relieve domestic unemployment. Also, the Moroccan state anticipated that emigrants would return to Morocco with the money and skills to contribute to prosperity. The government particularly encouraged residents of less developed regions to emigrate, primarily those living in the Rif Mountains and the Sioux region. The Berber inhabitants of exactly these regions were relatively poor and had also caused waves of unrest in the past. So, as Dutch contractors arrived in Morocco by the end of the 1950s, the Moroccan government sent them to the Rif Mountains, where mostly Berbers live. As a result of these policies, the, the majority of Dutch Moroccans is of Berber origin and is estimated at 80% of the community. This high concentration of migrants um, coming from one specific area is also the result of chain migration and later on family reunification. The Dutch government envisioned that guest workers would come for a period of a few years and subsequently return to their home country. However, it soon became clear that the temporary presence of foreign workers was impossible to sustain. In 1973, economic crisis set in and European countries introduced an immigration stop. But most migrants that were already there eventually succeeded in obtaining permanent residence through a series of Dutch legalization campaigns in the 1970s. In the process of accommodating these migrants, the Dutch allowed family reunification and marriage migration. It was presumed this would contribute to integration, uh, reduce money transfers to the country of origin, and stabilize families. As a result of these policies, in the 1980s, thousands of families emigrated from Morocco to reunite with husbands and fathers. Thus, the official immigration stopped uh, did not have any effect. Since then, the Moroccan community in the Netherlands has only increased in size, also by birth rate. 
Presently, more than two-thirds of all Moroccans hold Dutch nationality, and almost half of the community was actually born in the Netherlands. Despite that, nearly all members of this community still have Moroccan citizenship. Indeed, Moroccan, Morocco doesn't want to let go of these immigrants and seeks their political and eco economic loyalty. I'll now discuss the government's rhetoric and the many programs and policy uh, that it has initiated to make sure that for all generations of Moroccans abroad, the connection to the homeland will continue to exist. From the 1960s until the early 1990s, the government of King Hassan II sought to maintain full control over citizens abroad in order to guarantee their loyalty to the regime and to safeguard the vital remittance money they sent to Morocco. King Hassan also sought to prevent political opposition from abroad by using intimidation tactics. In those years, the official government policy was to discourage the integration and political participations of citizens in the host state. And the bottom line was that Moroccans should remain Moroccan. However, the zero tolerance approach of King Hassan II turned out to have a reverse effect and it seemed to alienate the migrant population. So in the 1990s, the Moroccan government gradually abandoned its repressive measures, measures and uh, looked for ways to appeal to its citizens abroad. Under the current King Mohammed VI, migrant policy became more positive and less confrontational. The government now emphasizes that it fully supports the integration of its citizens into European society. Yet, the unchanged bottom line of Moroccan migrant policy remains that Moroccan citizens abroad and their descendants are ultimately subjects of the king, who is the constitutional commander of all Moroccan faithful. Moroccan ties with its expatriate community are institutionalized through governmental departments and organizations. In 2008, an actual ministry in charge of the community abroad was established. An investigation of the ministry's stated objective and initiative shows that its activities are concentrated around the promotion of Moroccan culture and the Arabic language, encouraging and supporting potential investors and mobilizing the expatriate community to apply their skills in Morocco. Economically speaking, expatriates make a viable contribution to Morocco through remittance transfers. In order to attract and facilitate these remittances, the Moroccan government has developed special banking and foreign exchange services. And since 1968, Banque Centrale Populaire has been officially charged by the state with organizing the repatriation of hard currency and opened offices on embassy or consular grounds. Since recent years, this bank offers a set of uh, special banking services in line with migrants' needs. Uh, called Bladi Solutions. One such special banking product is the Sakana Mabruk, which is a credit available to citizens abroad seeking to buy real estate back in Morocco or to, buy a, uh, to build a house. Another new phenomenon is the emergence of real estate fairs in the Netherlands, geared towards Dutch Moroccans, uh, where the Moroccan housing market is being promoted. Another major source of income for Morocco comes from the holiday expenditures of those who visit their homeland every summer. For example, between 2006 and 2007, Moroccan migrants constitu constituted more than 40% of all tourists visiting Morocco. As it is in Morocco's interest to ensure that these migrants will keep visiting Morocco, a large project was set up to ensure the smooth arrival and pleasant stay of these migrants and that's called Operation Marhaba. Typically, Operation Marhaba is connected to a propaganda campaign along the lines of Welcome Home. As evidenced by the King's appearances, commercials and other promotional material. For example, the slogan of this operation is Wherever we are, Morocco is in us. Highlighting the emotional connection with the home country in terms of identity and pride is a central theme of Moroccan migrant policy. Many of the migrants' uh, ministry's activities are intended to boost Morocco's image and emphasize the oranges of uh, Moroccans living in Europe. The Hassan II Foundation for Moroccans Receding Abroad 
was established in 1990 and is active in developing Arab language instruction, Arabic language instruction, and um, Moroccan culture classes for children abroad, as well as cultural trips. As for religion, the foundation seeks contact with expatriates during Ramadan, distributing food and Qurans, and sends delegations of imams and religious te teachers abroad to minister to the com communities. A great deal of attention is paid to adv advocating an Islamic identity in line with that promoted by the regime. In Morocco, religion has long been the legitimizing element for the monarchy. As enshrined in the Moroccan constitution, the king is the political as well as the religious leader of the country. And it could be said that as long as Moroccans adhere to the Moroccan version of Islam, the position of the monarchy is safeguarded. There are several reasons why Rabat is concerned about the religious practices of its subjects abroad. First of all, rising Islamist movement both within Morocco and in the diaspora are perceived as a subversive threat to the established political order. Secondly, the connections between jihadist incidents and Moroccans living in Europe are numerous. For example, after security services broke up an Al-Qaeda network in Casablanca in June 2002, it appeared that most of the arrested Moroccans had been living in Europe for years. In order to combat radicalization, King Mohammed VI makes a vast effort to convey the expatriates his version of the Islamic faith. For instance, in 2008, the Council of Ulema for Moroccans in Europe was established with the aim to preserve Moroccan identity, faith and traditional values. This policy to promote Moroccan Islam is also related to a concern about competing influences from other Middle Eastern players who seek to reach Muslims living in Europe and could easily spread more radical views among them. Morocco deals with similar foreign influences at home, but it may consider its citizens abroad even more vulnerable to recruitment for, for radical causes. Needless to say, Moroccan government involvement with its subjects abroad had at times b been met um, by resistance from Dutch Moroccans or caused problems for their position in the host country. One primary example is Morocco's policy to make holding a Moroccan passport uh, mandatory for all generations of Moroccans, even if they are born in Europe, and to legally obstruct any effort to renounce the Moroccan nationality. This has implications for Moroccans in the Netherlands, ranging from the names they can give their children to judicial matters such as recognition of marriage, divorce and child custody. It should be noted that in the current political environment in the Netherlands, dual nationality has uh, become an issue of debate and is being increasingly related to dual loyalty. Also, Moroccan's efforts to make sure that Dutch Moroccans learn and speak Arabic is problematic. The Dutch government considers immigrants' acquisition of Dutch a first priority and believes fluency in the language will benefit integration. So foreign government pressure to achieve the opposite is viewed extremely negatively. Also, the relatively negative image of Muslims in the Netherlands in general adds to the sensitivity of the issue. On the one hand, this political climate tends to make Muslim immigrants look towards their own community and identity. But on the other hand, there are also those who feel they have to prove themselves in Dutch society. For example, by constantly emphasizing their Dutch identity and loyalty. They fear that Moroccan involvement has indirectly created a negative image of them in the host country. However, not all Dutch Moroccans perceive the Moroccan government's outreach as harmful or disturbing. In fact, they strongly disagree on whether the relation with Morocco exists on a voluntary basis or whether it is imposed on them. From my personal interviews with a very small amount of respondents, it already becomes clear how much members of the community differentiate in their opinion about Moroccan migrant policy. I've displayed some of their responses on the screen, although some of it fell off. <laughs> so I'll just tell you what, what they told me. Um, one respondent was convinced that the Moroccan government constantly interferes in the migrants' efforts to build a future in the, home, in the Netherlands and greatly hinders citizens in this, in this regard. 
On the other side of the spectrum, another respondent declared that the policy of the king does not bother him, saying the members of the diaspora often look for links with Morocco themselves. Another respondent does not see the problem either, and she said that in the end everyone can decide for himself whether he wants to do something with it or not. Actually, these changing attitudes, as well as the diversity of the community, pose a challenge to Moroccan migrant policy. The community is highly varied, consisting of men and women who immigrated to the Netherlands for work, family or marriage, or who were born in the Netherlands. They immigrated from different regions in Morocco and the majorities of Berber background. Although many continue to feel a certain attachment to Morocco, this can be manifested in very different ways. Some own a house in Morocco or others just visit Morocco in the summer. There's not one single way to describe the nature of the connection to Morocco. Moreover, on the religious level as well as on the level of civil society, there's no unified body to represent the entire community. Rather, there are hundreds. So, Moroccan government rhetoric and initiatives do not appeal to all the different segments within the Dutch, communi the Dutch Moroccan community. It is becoming especially difficult for the Moroccan government to reach the new generations abroad, which have been raised and educated in a Western political and cultural system. Morocco has increased its effort to reach out to the youth, to cultivate, cultivate their loyalty and remind them about their roots. It seeks to convince them to invest and do business in Morocco by introducing economic and fiscal initiatives. Nevertheless, the economic climate and range of opportunities remain far less appealing than those in the Netherlands. Finally, it's often argued that Dutch Moroccan youngsters are engaged in a search for self-identity, not least because they feel they do not fully belong in Dutch society. Although they may turn to their Moroccan origins as a result of this feeling of non-acceptance, some of them have emphasized their Berber or Muslim identity. Furthermore, youth are increasingly active on forums on the internet, and that is an area that the Moroccan government does not have much control over, because all these discussions are happening in Dutch. And a similar phenomenon is happening in the mosques. The younger generation is less interested in going to a Moroccan mosque and listening to Moroccan imams. They might prefer sermons in Dutch, or they may be interested in a different Islamic ideology. Um, or they may consider themselves secular. So to conclude, the Moroccan government has a long-standing interest in maintaining ties with its expatriate community. It perceives that the integration of its citizens into host societies should go hand in hand with a lasting Moroccan identity and a lasting connection to Morocco. Although many Moroccans residing in the Netherlands identify with their home country and feel a certain attachment to it, Ties weaken and change with the passage of time, especially among the new generations. For them, a lasting pride, with the um, a lasting pride of the motherland is combined with the notion that their future lies in the Netherlands. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Teresa.